They ruled the mightiest kingdoms, lightless trenches of crushing pressures where the sun never touches, unreachable seas that writhe in anger, jagged depths under sheer black cliffs. Their home is alien, elemental, and unforgiving, and here they are masters. Cruel geniuses possessing vast strength, they wait in the dark, weaving their plots, slowly considering their next abomination, their next move in an endless evil game of vast complexity. Not merely hulking mindless brutes nor cathedrals of flesh given fury, but sadists and torturers and unspeakable terrors, thinking goliaths of calculating hate. So many places exist where the sea touches the land and sky. So many places where krakens, the unseen masters of the ocean, might reach out their cruel tentacles to afflict the lives of men. Here we are, and I know that a lot of you have been waiting for this one. The Krakens, alongside the Ancient Dragons, are the second strongest monster in the Monster Manual. First place, of course, being given to the Tarrasque. The difference, of course, being that there is only one Tarrasque, but Krakens, there are many. Now first, let's go over to the Monster Manual to see what they tell us about these creatures. Now most of this here is mood setting, with no real tangible factoids about the creatures, but there's some juicy things that we can get that's useful to us. They tell us here that they sleep for untold ages, waiting for some failed sign or calling to awake, only to ravage civilization. Now, this part here is important, they tell us that at the beginning of time, the Krakens served as warriors of the gods. But when the gods' wars ended, the Krakens shrugged free of their servitude, never again to be bound by other beings. It says right here that Krakens have complete control over weather, that even from the deepest oceans, Krakens can give rise to storms at their will. Ominous darkness presages Kraken attacks. Over here, we get that Krakens can breathe air as well as water. It says here that adventurers tell that these creatures lair in the ruins of lakeside citadels. Interesting. Lastly, here at the end, it says Krakens are virtual gods, with cults and minions spread across sea and land. Others are allied with Olhydra, the evil princess of elemental water, and they use her cultists to enforce their will on land and sea. A kraken pleased with his worshippers can become rough seas and bring a bounteous, bounteous harvest of fish to the faithful. However, the devious mind of a kraken is ancient beyond reckoning and is ultimately bent on the ruination of all things. Now, it is funny that even though we were told that adventurers tend to find them in lakeside citadels, their actual lairs are down underwater in dark depths, usually a sunken rift or a cavern filled with detritus and wrecked ships. Not places where adventurers would normally be willing to go. So here it is, the Kraken entry in the Monster Manual, and it's actually pretty good. We even get a nice picture of... wait, what is that? Is that a Kraken? Are those fingers with nails? Now that's a mouth with teeth. Hold on a minute. Let's look back at the Kraken from 3rd edition. Okay, so this is how the creature looked back then. Now let's look at pictures from 2nd edition. Uh-huh, now a picture from the 1st edition. Alright, so, so those make sense. We, we see how a Kraken is supposed to look like. Now let's bring in the concept art for the Kraken in 5th edition. Now, that is a crazy big change. We essentially jumped from the Kraken of Norse mythology to the Kraken from H.P. Lovecraft. And do you want to know why? Well, well, let's talk about what the Monster Manual does not tell you about Krakens. To answer the immediate question, first let's cover what the average, original, normal Kraken looks like. Even though to many of you it might already seem fairly obvious, the Kraken of Dungeons and Dragons is a giant squid. It averages about 100 feet long and it possesses either 8 or 10 tentacles, which probably 
depends on the breed. Now, in real life, the biggest squid is believed to have been about 46 feet long, so about half the size of a kraken. Normal squids also have eight arms and two tentacles, with rare variations having more arms. The appendage of a cephalopod can be either an arm or a tentacle. Technically, those are not interchangeable. If the limb has suckers all throughout the extension of the appendage, then it is an arm. If the limb only has suckers at the end tip or has no suckers at all, then it is a tentacle. This is an arm, this is a tentacle. A squid, for example, has eight arms and two tentacles. The kraken, being a rare form of the gargantuan squid, basically follows the same pattern. It is important to make the distinction between the arms and the tentacles because they actually do very different things and they have very different lengths, as you can clearly see. The actual tentacles are about twice as long as the arms, sometimes reaching up to 100 feet in length, and those ones are the ones that you actually need to be concerned about. And that is because a normal kraken has barbs and spikes and teeth that grow on their tentacles, which they use to maul and cut people with. The tentacles is what the kraken uses to grab people which they intend to eat. If the kraken grabs you with its barbed tentacles, it's because it intends to drop you into its mouth to devour you. If the kraken grabs you with its arms, it is either to hold on to you or to fling you away. Very important distinction here, guys, and the monster manual does not cover any of this. That's why you gotta know what's a difference is between a tentacle and an arm. It actually matters. Every kraken has two tentacles that are filled with barbs. Every single version of the kraken has had this, and it is very explicit in the lore. The monster manual doesn't show this at all, which is most bizarre, considering that even certain illustrations of the kraken for 5th edition campaigns show the creature how it is actually supposed to look like. This, for example, is a 5th edition showing of a baby kraken, which of course resembles the 3rd edition version almost to a T and every single version before it. The barbed tentacles do a lot more damage than a normal arm attack, and their range, of course, as I said before, is doubled as well, which is also not shown on the 5th edition Monster Manual version. I should also mention that in the Monster Manual, the tentacle attack says that each of the 10 tentacles can grapple a target. Do keep in mind that in the Monster Manual, the word arm and tentacle are interchangeable, so it might be a little bit confusing, but in the lore, it is very explicitly stated that the Kraken would never use all of his appendages to attack or grapple, it would instead always, without a doubt, keep at least two of its arms in reserve for moving and balance. The Kraken moves and swims using at least two of its arms, so it will always keep at least two of those in order to maneuver and possibly escape if it needs to. The Kraken will always prioritize escape rather than victory. Now, the mouth of a kraken is a beak, as it is also for real-life giant squids, except, of course, that the giant beak of a kraken's mouth has the necessary crushing power to split a whale in half. That's not hyperbole either, that's an actual quote. Now, what's interesting is that there's actually reasons to believe that not all krakens can breathe in air as they do water, though the vast majority of them do. There are seemingly some recorded cases of krakens being routed and kept from the sea who suffocated and died, though of course many more cases of krakens being able to sustain themselves above sea seemingly without worry for a long period of time. This gets complicated once you understand that air breathing magic is really easy to come up with. Any competent kraken of mage casting age should be able to come up with spells to breathe in air without a problem. They are really smart. Quite honestly, it would be the first spell any kraken should get. So, whether they naturally obtain air-breathing abilities as they grow older, or whether they develop them through magic, or whether it depends on the breed of the kraken, it is still unknown. What we do know is that there's definitely some krakens, albeit very rare, that cannot breathe in air. Now, everything that I just kind of showed you guys is what a generic, normal kraken would look like. Meaning, that's how a newborn kraken would look like hatching from an egg, and how it would look like if it were to simply grow older naturally. Thing is, krakens are not like beholders, or mind flayers, or dragons who actually think of their bodies as perfect. They don't see their bodies as the pinnacle of evolution like those other races. They do see themselves as gods, but they don't like to limit themselves to the body that they possess. Because of that, they actually change their bodies a lot. 
through dark rituals they might grow a head with lines of teeth or they might grow claws or more than two eyes. Through experimentation they might adhere metal to their bodies to strengthen their weakness. Through alchemy they might enhance their flesh to resist attacks or spells. The body of a kraken is merely a starting point for multiple lines of experimental evolution. Evolution that leads to all of the different variations that you might have seen for this primeval monster. This is why the 5th edition art shows some mutated behemoth of Lovecraftian origin as the Kraken. That's why you might see a colossal octopus as a Kraken. That's why you might see this in your campaign as a Kraken. There is a canonical Kraken called Turbitus that looks like Hermios Mora from Skyrim. Just a swollen red eye as a body with countless tentacles surrounding its circular form. Really, with a Kraken, anything is possible. They love to change their bodies all the time if it'll make them stronger. Now, as far as who created the Krakens and how long they have been in existence, that's a true mystery. The Monster Manual mentions the godly battle where the Krakens fought as warriors, but as expected, it doesn't really delve much into it at all. Superstitious folk claim that evil gods made the Krakens so that creatures of the land would never dare stray far from their homes. Others claim that the Avalids created the Krakens as warriors, possibly during their war against the gods. Now the truth is that no living mortal knows exactly as so much time has passed and those stories have fallen from truths to legends to finally myths. Krakens themselves believe something entirely different. In the deepest trenches of the ocean floor, in the darkest depths of the abyss of the world, in there lies a kraken of unimaginable size. See, krakens are, for all intents and purposes, immortal, in the sense that they don't die of old age, but as they grow older, they grow bigger. Their size never stops growing as time passes, which is why even though the average Kraken is about 100 feet long, there are many stories of these monsters being confused for entire islands. But on the farthest reaches of the planet, where light has never touched and no mortal has laid eyes on, in the blackest depths is the biggest Kraken. The rest of the Krakens call this one the Great Unbeheld. They claim that its size is impossible and that its tentacles thread through the depths of the entire world. They claim that it slumbers and if it were to rise, it would flood the world, giving Krakens dominion over all. But it waits. It waits for the signs. The Krakens believe that only by claiming all the oceans of the world and dominating all sea-bound creatures, that only then will the Great Unbeheld awaken and conquer everything. They also believe that this massive monster was the original Kraken, that they all came from its massive mouth. Although the Krakens don't worship the Great Unbeheld as a god, it is treated as a communal ancestor and given the greatest of respects. This monstrous leviathan is thought to be the favored child of Pansuriel, a long-gone evil god of the seas, a leftover memory of an ancient battle of gods. The god of the sea's foulest evils, Pansuriel ever seeks twisted minds and abominable visionaries to carry out his will both below and above the waves. The writhing one welcomes all evil ocean-dwelling creatures into his crushing fold, with Zahwagen, sea hags, scrags, and quotoas proving particularly prevalent. However, Pansuriel prefers creatures warped of body as well as of mind, making krakens his favorite children. You might remember before we mentioned Krakens love to change their bodies to suit their needs or to simply make themselves stronger. They shift and move their flesh through experiments and magic. This Pansuriel loved. Now in eons long lost, Pansuriel sought to make the darkened lands below the sea his exclusive dominion, perverting them into rolling seas of fluid horrors. An alliance of opposed gods led by Deep Sashilas, the, the elvish goddess of the sea, rose to resist the writhing one. They were victorious and in the last battle, Pansuriel lost one of its legs before it was banished away from the material plane. 
Its gnarled appendage, however, fell into the darkest depths of the ocean, never to be found by the forces of good. Thus, even nowadays, Bansuril retains his link to the mortal world through this fleshy appendage, and using its favorite minions, it still seeks to corrupt the seas and avenge his ancient exile. The one who protects and guards this godly appendage is none other than Bansuril's favorite child, the Great Unbeheld. If there is a god that Krakens venerate, it would be Pansuriel. What it demands of its followers is not much, merely sometimes the sacrifice of aquatic elves, who the god sees as its ancient and most hated enemy, of course, because of Deep Sashila's victory over him. Religion is actually one of the biggest reasons for Krakens to actually hold slaves, for it is through them that they build temples to Pansuriel and perform the necessary prayers. The prayers are hugely complex, low-tonal chants, usually conducted in vast groups performed in caves underwater. The echoing songs of Pansuriel's worshippers are sometimes heard even on the surface, where marineers refer to the doleful droning as the Whale of the Severed God. The temples are huge cave complexes deep underwater or simple stone circles centered around tentacled idols. Krakens often force slaves to toil for centuries, digging unholy trenches deep enough to reveal portals leading to the Pool of Pensuriel, said to fester somewhere in Carceri, one of the lower plains. Opening one of these portals would look like something out of Cthulhu. Now, slaves are actually huge in Kraken behavior, which is not something mentioned at all in the manual. The manual doesn't really go over what truly happens generally in the life of a Kraken. Like, what does the creature do under there in the ocean? Does he just float, skimming about things? No, of course not. It is a combination of the rigorous hunting exercises that it must follow for it to be able to feed, combined with the time it takes to obtain a high amount of slaves which it wants, and the strenuous exercises that mating brings. We will talk about these one by one. See, Krakens are always feeding. That's because their appetites are legendary. To them, the greatest whale constitutes little more than a fair meal. This creates a few problems for them because it means that they must hold vast territories for which to feed. Territories that they need to protect from other Krakens and other monsters. This is why they are solitary. That, combined with the fact that Krakens are highly suspicious of other Krakens, since generally speaking, an adult Kraken will always take advantage of a younger Kraken by persuading it to do dangerous tasks that the older, wiser Kraken doesn't want to do. They are very selfish creatures that truly only care for themselves. If a Kraken could hold another Kraken as a slave, it would, but alas, that is always a very difficult, if not impossible, task. Obtaining slaves is the second most important hobby for the Kraken, for it is through the slaves that the Kraken will get most of what it does done. See, the Kraken has the magical ability to create pockets of breathable water, and using this ability creates facilities in cavern systems deep in the ocean to hold its slaves. These slaves will never see the light of day, and for entire generations they will serve the Kraken as a god. Generations and generations of slaves that will never know any better, serving the Kraken's whims, being tortured and transformed into hideous monsters. See, in the same way that the Kraken enjoys changing its own body through magic or experimentation or alchemy, so does it enjoy doing that to its slaves, if it better helps them serve its purpose. These slaves, if liberated, never do well in the surface having been traumatized for their entire lives. Now, when a Kraken hunts for slaves, it attempts to do so with as little risk as possible to him. In fact, its favorite method is not to simply go to a ship and sink it, as you might have been led to believe. Instead, it uses his ability to create storms and modify the winds to trap ships into its territory. The Kraken will use this magic to pull the ships closer and closer to its desired spot, and then attempt to sink the ship by merely using Using strong waves, wind, and thunder strikes. If the ship sinks and the Kraken manages to collect living specimens without him even showing himself, then that's a perfect victory. I mentioned this before, but I need to reiterate it. To a Kraken, self-preservation is everything. They are schemers and planners. Th there is no honor and there is no pride. They do what they do to win. Retreat is always an option for the Kraken and it will never fight to the death. 
Now we're entering the last part, the mating process for the Kraken. See, the urge to mate for a Kraken is extreme and unavoidable. Many other races suffer these urges, of course. It is fairly natural to be compelled to mate by your biology, but for Krakens it is a couple of degrees above that. They call this process the hateful compulsion, a touchy-feely ritual that Krakens are forced to go through with their bodies, which they loathe. Their cold, calculating brains detest the concept of being made to perform this touchy and dangerous ritual. Every 100 years or so, even though Krakens are solitary, they will be gathered together in the deep ocean trenches. They gather both fearful of the danger in doing so, but unable to control their lustful compulsion. Quote, Males frequently get torn to pieces by the less numerous females in their insane desire to be fertilized, turning the sea black with cracking blood and causing parts of limbs and heads to wash ashore in oily froths. In their coitus-fueled madness, krakens involuntarily create cataclysmic storms, leading to horrifically sized whirlpools and waves which might rage for months or even years." End quote. The hateful compulsion will last until all of the present females are impregnated, something that, quote, forces a male to struggle for life within its mate's grip, a lustful battle capable of lasting for months, end quote. What's particularly interesting is that many males will do whatever it takes to avoid the hateful compulsion if possible. Many Kraken males will attempt surgery upon themselves to remove the part of their brain they believe forces them into these moots, or will castrate themselves using potions. In fact, it has been catalogued of a number of Krakens who have actually seeked undeath in order to avoid mating. It wouldn't be at all surprising if most of the Krakens that don't look like squids forced this change upon themselves to avoid this ritual. After a female kraken is impregnated, she will lay great black cylindrical eggs deep in the oceanic trenches, who will take about a decade to hatch. Thank you guys so much for watching. I would like to personally thank my patron supporters, Rukado Fan, Major Fail Gaming, Wyatt Curlin, Barry Mascant, 5E Magic Shop. Anthony Clayes, Thraxerus, Toby Oliver, Dylan Baker, Zach Bowell, Simon Hallman, and Midi Ogre at best for supporting me on Patreon at the $25 level. If you would like to support me as well, then please head on over to patreon.com slash MrRex to support. Thank you guys so much for watching. This video was long and it took me a while to edit as well. I I wanted to have it done last week, but you know, alas, here we are. Uh, sorry about that, but I really truly hope that you liked it. Uh, make sure to go and watch the playlist for all of my Dungeons and Dragons videos. They're all as good as this one, I, I promise you. Make sure to follow me on Twitter and leave me a comment down here uh, telling me what you thought of the video and what monster you want me to cover next. Thank you once again, and I'll see you all next time.